Hey guys, it's Matt here, and I've got the video review of Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess. This is the game you've all been waiting for. I know you're really looking forward to this one, so we're going to jump right into it. Twilight Princess is what I would deem the spiritual sequel to Ocarina of Time which is a game that, you know, many people consider to be the best title ever created. What you've got with Twilight Princess is a game that follows the same structure. You're going to be visiting a lot of the same places, seeing some familiar faces, and you're going to have a general feeling that will give you a sense of deja vu for anybody who's played the original classic. What you're going to find right off the bat is that the game's got a very similar control scheme to the previous titles, which is fantastic. These controls worked, and they continue to work, and actually they're made better with the Wii controller. It doesn't detract from the experience, it actually enhances it, so if you had some fears about that, put those to rest. Let me tell you why the control works. The Wii Remote effectively becomes Link's sword. You swing it left and right, and he'll do his sword swipes. It's that easy, really, and it actually feels good. What slashing with the Wii Remote does do, though, is replace the functionality of the buttons. So all of that old functionality you've got, but it's just mapped to the Wii Remote now. You're not gaining any new abilities, but you're not losing anything either, and it feels great. Actually, the more you play it, say 10, 15 hours in especially, once you've got everything down, uh, it feels very satisfying to swing the Wii Remote. I would not go back to the GameCube version. But beyond just being a replacement, the Wii Remote actually adds to the experience because you do feel a sense of what you're actually doing. When you make a move, it's more immersive. You can really feel it. Here's a good example, and it actually references a brand new move in the game. What you couldn't do before in any Zelda game is run while swiping your sword. But you can do it now, and it actually feels really good as you run through, say, you know, a grassy field, and you're just basically going back and forth with your Wii Remote, and it's slicing everything in front of you. It's a simple addition, but it goes a long way. Where the Wii Remote really obliterates the GameCube controller is when you need to actually aim at something. So let's say you've got your slingshot out and you want to target something. There, the Wii Remote acts as your reticule. You simply point the screen, look at what you want to target, and then fire away. And you can do this with a level of accuracy and a level of speed that simply was not possible before. And what's great is that you can actually do all of this while you're riding on top of Epona too. We've all been playing with the traditional control scheme for so long, so I can understand why you'd be skeptical of something so totally new. But give this a try, really, you're going to like it. After you've played it with just a few minutes, it comes together, it feels very natural, and you will not want to go back. Beyond the new Wii controls, there is, of course, a lot to this new game. Let's talk about sheer scope for a second, and I'm just going to throw some numbers at you. These might not be accurate, but uh, this is what I came up with when I played. We're talking a 50 to 70 hour game, depending on whether or not you go into all the side quests, if you check out fishing, if you go to any of the day-to-day -day activities that sort of make this a living, breathing world. Hyrule is humongous, and you can go all around it. You're not limited in any way. You can go on foot, you can take Epona, or you can go in wolf form. Beyond that, you can also warp at any time, which saves an incredible amount of time. What we can't show you in video because it would take forever is how long it takes to walk from one end to the other. But rest assured, you've never come close to seeing a Zelda game this big before. Hyrule Field is immense. It's going to take you forever just to walk around it. And on top of that, you've got villages to explore. You have a whopping almost 10 temples. And beyond everything else, you've got places that, you know, are not going to affect at all your day-to-day -day game. But you can go there just to have fun. We're not going to give away any spoilers, but we will tell you that the story in the game is far more cinematic and much darker than it has been in previous Zelda games. It looks to us like Nintendo has taken the cinematics far more seriously than it has in the past, too. And actually, we're going to show you a snippet of one of those scenes. And this is not a spoiler. You're not going to know what's really going on. But we think it creates a mood and an atmosphere all the same. Check it out. I find myself much more engaged, much more engrossed in the storyline because the presentation is much better. Getting back to how the game plays and how much it offers in terms of temples, we're going to give you a few examples here. The puzzles will definitely feel very familiar to anybody who's played Zelda. They do to me. Don't get me wrong, if you've played any Zelda game before, some of these puzzles are going to seem familiar. That said, they're still very complex, they're challenging, and they're clever. 
And what's great is that a lot of them make use of devices and objects and items and weapons that you get throughout the game. And in traditional Zelda or even Metroid form, you know, you'll come to a place where you might not be able to do anything the first time. You get a new weapon, you come back there, and all of a sudden you can advance. The temples themselves do have a very Ocarina of Time feel to them, so you will have a lava world, you will have a snow world, you'll have the forest temple, you'll have all of those. But as you advance through the game, you're going to see Twilight Temples, and you're also going to see brand new stuff that is completely new to this franchise. Stuff that's really out there. So it's both nostalgic and completely new. Of course, at the end of each of these temples, you're going to find your traditional bosses. And these do not disappoint. They are big, they are varied, and they're creepy. One complaint I do have about the bosses, however, is that I think they're a little too easy. I would often find that having bested a boss, uh, my life force would be at full count. In other words, while the technique to beating these bosses is still fun and engaging, they're not so challenging. I think it's important to remember here that Zelda Twilight Princess is really a GameCube title that's been ported over to Wii. That said, it is one of the prettiest titles to hit Nintendo's new system, it really is. And it's really varied and exceptionally complex. Whether you're riding Epona through Hyrule Field or mingling with the people of Castletown, uh, it feels like a living, breathing world. The scope of the landscapes are immense too. Anywhere you can look, you can ride to. And oftentimes you'll see some temples you haven't been to looming in the distance. While Hyrule itself is pretty impressive, you've also got the Twilight World, which is sort of the alter ego to Hyrule. And this world here is very bloom effect filled. It's got particle effects flowing all over the place. It's got a very surreal, different, original look. That's very pleasing. It's very unlike Metroid's Dark Aether World, which I found to be a bit boring. Also, only on Wii will you get Zelda running both in progressive scan and 16x9 mode. It only runs in pro scan on GameCube, not 16x9. That noted, not everything in the game is beautiful. As I said, this is a GameCube title ported over, and that does show too. You do see some technical shortcomings here, including low-poly characters and environments, generally speaking. And Nintendo uh, isn't really concerning itself with high-resolution, sort of crisp textures. As a result, especially during cinematics where the camera is framed up close, you'll be able to see some very blurry background objects. Even so, this is a pretty game. Nintendo has done a lot with the art here. The characters are interesting. And it all comes together for a pretty visceral package. I hate to be a nitpicker, but I have to complain. Just a little gripe about sound. First of all, Nintendo has chosen yet again not to include voice work, and I think that creates a very claustrophobic feeling in the universe. None of these characters quite come to life because you're reading text blurbs instead of listening to them talk. On top of that, despite the fact that Nintendo has some of the best compositions in the business, most of the soundtracks in the game are MIDI and not orchestrated, which I think is a huge disappointment. Alright, we've come to the end of the video review, and you want to know what is the deal with this game. The answer, it's the best Zelda video game ever created, but it's not perfect. If you've come to this game expecting something completely new, something totally revolutionary, as you did maybe the first time you played Ocarina of Time and got it, well, you're just not going to get that here. What you will get is a refined, amazing, epic Zelda. The best Zelda, period. I really think that with Wii Sports, Nintendo has hit the casual gamer, but it has not forgotten about you either. This is your game. This is the epic undertaking that's going to take you through all the holiday season and you're going to enjoy every minute of it. I've given this a 9.5 and an Editor's Choice Award, both no-brainers. It's not a big surprise. Don't waste any more time listening to us. Go play this game for yourself. Ha, 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 ha.